Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the City Council meeting for Monday, August 20th, 2012. And I'll call our meeting to order. And would, Madam Clerk, would you please take the roll? Yes, sir. Council Member Holly. Here. Council Member Long. Here. Council Member Westfall. Here. And Mayor Pro Tem Ania. Yeah. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Under acknowledgments this evening, we have none. We uh, are coming out of closed session, and our city attorney, Bob Black, do we have anything to report out of closed session? Um, Mr. Mayor, no, uh, no final actions were taken in closed session tonight. Thank you. Next is our consent agenda, agenda calendar, and we have four items on there. Does anyone in the council have any questions from the consent agenda? I do. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and pull item four off of the consent agenda. Okay. Item four will pull. And I will move to approve items one through three. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any public comment on consent items one, two, and three? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, if you'd pull the vote. Yes, sir. Council Member Westfall? Yes. Council Member Shalong? Yes. Council Member Holly? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Ania? Yes. And we'll go to item number four on the consent agenda. And that's the authorize the city manager to sign an agreement with GR Construction for the construction of the MBR chemical waste storage systems concrete foundations. And Council Member Shalong? Uh, yeah. Mr. Weir, would you like to? I have a few questions. Good evening. Thank you. Um, I was uh, interested in the uh, lar the diverse um, uh, stretch between the numbers of the low bid and the higher bids that came in. Uh, yes, we found that very interesting as well. Uh, when we put this project out to bid, I thought the bids were going to come in right around 15, 16,000 as I ran the numbers. When they started to come in, uh, I, I kind of asked the, the contractors, you know, that boy, that's, that's really... Uh, a lot more than what we had expected the project to, to come back in at and they basically just just put it to the fact that one it was short timing for when we wanted the project completed and secondly that they're very busy right now so you know the one contractor he's doing a lot of work with on the Walmart project I know another one's working on the harbor and so if they were going to do it it had to be worth it for them okay and what is a payment bound that should that should be payment bond oh okay <laughs> So that was a uh, that was a typo in his bid. Okay. And is uh, GR Construction here tonight? They are not here tonight. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other council members with questions on consent item number four? Is no. there a motion? I'd like to move uh, to authorize the city manager to sign an agreement with GR Construction for the construction of the MBR Chemical Waste Storage Systems Concrete Foundation. Is there a second? Uh, second. Thank you. Is there any public comment on consent item number four? Seeing none, please pull the vote. Yes, sir. Council Member Holly? Yes. Council Member Westfall? Yes. Council Member Shalong? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem and yeah. Yes. Okay, we'll move on to, um, there's no reports or presentations tonight. So we'll move on to item number four, and that, or number five, and that's a, a journey to the Housing Authority. And we'll, we'll go to that, and I'll call the meeting of the Housing Authority uh, to order. Madam Clerk, would you please take roll? Yes, sir. Director Westfall? Here. Director Shalong? Here. Director Holly? Here. And Chairman Inia. I'm here. Thank you. This is the time for public comment regarding the Crescent City Housing Authority. Does anyone have any public comment on the Housing Authority? All right. Seeing none, we'll go to our consent calendar, items one, two, and three. Is there a motion for approval? I'd move to approve the consent calendar. <clears throat> 
It's been moved Second. and seconded for approval of the consent calendar for the Crescent City Housing Authority. Is there any public comment on the consent calendar? Seeing none, would you please take the roll? Yes, sir. Director Westfall? Yes. Director Shalong? Yes. Director Holly? Yes. And Chairman Ninia? Yes. Next is the housing director's report, and there, there isn't one. We have a public hearing. The public hearing, that's item four, is to consider and approve revisions to the housing authority's administrative plan and to approve resolution 2012-29, a resolution of the Crescent City Housing Authority adopting revised administrative plan for the housing choice voucher program. And Megan Hansen is here, our, Megan Miller, I'm sorry, our housing authority director. Megan. Good evening. So does this thing need to come down or? Okay. Okay. So what we have on the agenda tonight is the Housing Authority's revised administrative plan. The admin plan is kind of like a policies and procedures manual for the Housing Authority. It includes all of the regulations that are set by the federal government and then outlines the different policies and procedures that the Housing Authority will use to administer the program within those regulations. It also establishes a guideline for staff to refer to so that we know that all participants and applicants are being treated equally and that the same practices are being applied across the board. There are 16 chapters in the revised admin plan, so there's a lot of material that we are covering here. Um, many of the, the revisions are minor wording changes or they provide clarification or definitions where they were not previously included or they're regulatory changes that we don't have any control over. So what I did is I went through and selected what I felt were the most significant revision changes and I have a slideshow that I'm gonna go over what those changes are. So the biggest changes are in chapters two, three, four, five, and seven. Beginning with chapter two, which is fair housing and opportunity, we are adding some language in there to all of our applications, recertification packets, and notices of adverse action, which will notify our clientele about their rights to a reasonable accommodation if one is needed for a disability. The reason we're putting that in there now is because we have a lot of new families on the program. So we just wanna make sure we're taking every opportunity to, to make sure that our applicants and participants know about, about that. The bigger change in chapter two is that we will be providing written translation of our vital documents, the voucher, the application, some of the different required HUD release forms for each language group that constitutes 5% or more of our families served. So we will collect that data by sending out a letter to all of our waiting list applicants and all of our participants asking if English is not the primary language spoken in the home, what is? And then based on the results that we get from those letters, any language group that constitutes 5% or more of the total, we will provide translation into that language. So right now we have 530 families on the program and about 250 on the waiting list. So 5% of that is about 40 families. So if we got 40 responses saying Russian is the primary language spoken in the home, we would provide translation into Russian. Although I don't think we will need to do it with Russian. I think that probably the, the only group that's gonna hit that 5% that threshold is our Hmong client base. So I've been working with Chief Plack. He's been helping me to identify some resource in the community that we might be able to utilize for the translation of those documents. So that's been a real big help. Chapter three, eligibility. The significant change that we have here is that we are proposing to change the denial policy from three years to five years for drug-related criminal activity. That's based on industry standard recommendation. Also, it's more consistent with our violent drug-related policy. It 
it's currently three years for drug and five years for violent, and we think it will just be more consistent if we just say five years for drug and violent criminal activity. The applicants who are denied for drug-related criminal activity will still have the opportunity to request an informal review, which is our appeal process. And typically, if they can show that they are receiving treatment or that they've completed treatment, many times that denial is, is overturned anyway. Um, kind of going hand in hand with that is that we are also proposing to change the penalty period from three years to five for families who are terminated for violating the program. I think that we need to have a little more teeth to our our consequences because with three years it's very easy to just turn right back around sign up again and then too often we we see the same thing happening again so I think if we have a five-year policy that's a little bit heavier of a consequence and it has a little more value to it can I um ask you a question at you this can. point, Megan. Mm -hmm. What about the landlords who have engaged in drug-related or violent criminal activity? Are they dropped from the program? It's a little harder with landlords because we don't have any way to run a criminal history check on a landlord. We don't have them sign the same release forms. They're not held under the same requirements as the participants. We have had cases where we have stopped working with landlords because their acts that they were committing just in their relationship with the housing authority were not conducive to what we expect, but we don't have the same authority to check the backgrounds of landlords like we do for our, our applicants and our participants. Why is that? Well. Part of it is because many landlords probably wouldn't agree to that. And we need the landlords in order to make the program work. So if we see someone, a landlord, doing something that is illegal or that we think is not right with the tenants, we usually do step in when, when we feel that it's appropriate. And we have stopped working with landlords in the past. It doesn't happen a whole lot, but it has happened. Okay. I have, I have just a real quick question. Under that same topic, um, if, if someone, we're just talking about applicants now, right? If they're already a participant, At this, this doesn't have retroactivity to their No, and not unless they lied at the time that they completed the application. Okay, thank you. In that case, there would be a problem. There should be, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so continuing with that, um, the only other notable change in Chapter 3 is that we are adding some language to our denial of admission notices, which will give people some ideas about if they are in a situation where they are the victim of domestic violence, that they should come in and, and ask us about the Violence Against Women Act, because there are some protections that can be afforded to them if they're in that circumstance. Chapter four is applications, waiting list, and tenant selection. Um, not really two significant changes here, but we have changed the way that we do our application process. We're no longer having the monthly application sessions over at the Cultural Center. We are trying to move with the times, so we have our application online now, and we also have it in our office for people that don't have internet access um, or have difficulty getting it online. And we are now going to be placing the applications on the waiting list on an initial assessment basis. So what's been happening is when the families submit the application the way we're currently doing it, we run a full eligibility screening on them. We check, verify their income, verify their criminal background, verify their previous participation history. And then we have to do all of that again when they reach the top of the wait list because their income may have changed. There may have been some criminal incidents that took place between the time that the application was submitted and the time they reached the top of the wait list. So we're really doing it twice. 
when we could just be doing it once. Um, so we're just going to take the application based on what the applicant states, and then when they reach the top of the wait list, we would run the full eligibility screening. That will also enable us to respond in a more, a more quick, how you say that, more quickly when the family submits their application, it takes us a while at this point to process it. We've got to run all the checks, wait for the income verifications. This way we can do it in a more quick fashion and the families will not have to wait so long to be told whether or not they're placed on the waiting list. Megan, has there been any progress in legislation on uh, allowing us to choose local uh, residents versus out of town residents? We have done that. So we do have a preference on our waiting list that we can't deny, I mean, anyone from any area of the United States is eligible to apply for our waiting list, but they will have a longer wait over someone that has a Del Norte County address. Is that what you mean? Yeah, but I, and I, I do remember that we had a preference, but um, I thought that there was some, some kind of legislation that was being looked at to fix that problem. I think I know what you're talking about. You're right. There is, they are, they have a portability reform act that they're looking at, which these things can take a while with HUD, but what they are saying is that the proposed rule would make it so that other housing authorities, instead of billing us for that person's assistance, they can only, if they open their waiting list to take new applicants, they have to take those portability people first so that they won't be able to bill us for somebody living in San Francisco if they open their wait list to more to bring more people onto their program, which will help. It won't eliminate the problem, but it will help because our, our portability expenses are really high and they continue to be. I don't know how long it's gonna take before that becomes. It just seems like it should be a priority. It does. It and seems like we should pay for our own residents that are on our program and not residents that move out of the area and pay for them to go live somewhere else. It just doesn't I seem agree. like it's a good process. It's not. And I think that's <clears throat> why they have introduced this act because a lot of housing is called the Reportability Act. Portability. Portability. Port I think it's Portability Reform Act. Thank you. You're welcome. In chapter five, which is briefings and voucher issuance, the time frame for reporting changes is going from 14 business days to 10 business days. That's another industry standard recommendation. It will also enable us to adjust participant rent more expeditiously. Also, we will be automatically approving one 30-day extension of the voucher term for anybody who needs one. And then finally, chapter seven, which is verifications. HUD's verification hierarchy has been changed to reflect participant supplied income verification over third party written, which is really good for us because that took a lot of administrative work, sending out third party verifications, tracking them, following up with them, not to mention the, the costs associated with the postage. So that has been, has been really good for us and it's a much more efficient way of doing things, I think. We are also going to be accepting tribal IDs as verification of legal identity for adults. And all documentation that is submitted as evidence of social security numbers will no longer be retained longer than one year because once it's been verified, there's just no reason for us to, to keep that. So we're going to shred that at the time of the family's first annual recertification after they come onto the program. Is that a local choice or is that a, a federal? It's industry standard recommendation. It hasn't become a hard and fast rule by HUD yet, but I think they're moving in that direction. And I 
tend to agree that I don't like to have my social security card copies of it floating around anywhere. So, sure. so those are, are the biggest changes. Um, again, most of the other changes are minor wording things, definitions. And I did want to add that although the public review period is now closed, the any member of the public at any time is welcome to come into our office, review the plan. It's in the Housing Authority office. It's over at City Hall offices. It's available online at the city website. We are always looking for suggestions for ways that we can improve. There, are, any feedback is is always appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Yeah. Does any other members have any questions of Megan? No. I just had one quick one. The 240 people that are waiting, how long does that waiting list take generally? This year it's been going quicker than ever because we normally we pull on average about 150 people a year. Okay. So the wait average is about 18 months. This year we've pulled two pulls of 135 each, so that's 270. And then we just pulled another 175 people. Okay. So it's moving really fast right now. We probably won't do another pull until the middle of next year. What do you, what do you attribute that trend to? It's really weird. I, I don't know. I've never seen it like this. What's happening is our response um, rate is decreased. You know, we when we send out these 175 letters, typically these invitation letters, we would see at least at least 130 people show up from that 175, and it's way down this year. Hmm. So, okay. you know, I, I don't know why that is. Thank you. Thank you for your yes. report, and thank you for those CDs. You're welcome. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay, we have no further business with the... Um, oh, do we? Oh, go ahead. And I move to uh, approve the revisions to you Resolution 2012-29, a resolution of the Crescent City Housing Authority adopting revised administrative plan for the Housing Choice public Voucher hearing. Program. Public hearing. Oh, this is a public hearing. That's yeah. true. I, is there a second? Yeah. Well, yet. Yeah. Oh, it's a public hearing. We have to hold it till next month, too. No, I think you can take the motion and then open the public hearing. Good. It's okay, okay. as long as you don't vote first. Is there a second? <laughs> second. Thank you. Okay, this is a public hearing, so members of the public may speak on what you've just heard. Is there any public comment on the Crescent City Housing Authority? Yes. Please state your name and if you're city or county. Thank you. Hi, I, I'm Jody Hoon, county, and, and I... Um, I want to acknowledge and thank the Housing Authority for, uh, for adding the eligibility language that it's not appropriate to deny uh, domestic violence victims for eligibility. I think it's a really important um, discussion to have um, for education purposes about Violence Against Women Act and for individuals who are applying for, for uh, eligibility. So thank you. Thank you, Jody. Any other comment on our Housing Authority? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the, uh, the board. Could you take, uh, we can vote tonight on this, correct? Yeah, there's a motion on the floor. Oh, the motion, that's right. Would you take uh, roll call, please? Yes, or sir. Poll, please. Yes, sir. Director Holly? Yes. Director Shalong? Yes. Director Westfall? Yes. And Chairman Ania? Yes. And we have no continuing business, no new business, so adjournment is, we'll adjourn from the Housing Authority, and we will... We will open our Crescent City Successor Agency to Redevelopment Agency. It's a mouthful. Call that to order, and would you please take roll? Director Westfall? Here. Director Shalong? Here. Director Holly? Here. And Chairman Ania? Here. Our first order of business has the Successor Agency to Redevelopment is uh, public comment. People may uh, comment on our successor, successor agency to redevelopment agency. Is there any public comment on this uh, matter? Seeing none, we'll go to the consent calendar and it's for approval of the minutes of July 16, 2012. Is there a motion for approval? Move to approve. Second. Moved and approved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, passes. 
Executive director's report, there isn't any. Business items, there's none. Public hearing, none under new business. We have a, a resolution to consider and approve. A resolution of the City Council of Crescent City serving as the successor agency to the dissolved redevelopment agency of the City of Crescent City, approving and adopting the recognized obligation payment schedule, also called ROPES 3, for the period of January 1st, 2013 through June 30th, through 2013, pursuant to Health and Safety Code Section 34117I. And is there a... I'm going to ask Mr. McDonald to do a presentation on this. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, this one is very similar to the... Um, the ROPS that was approved before, but we've had some further information from uh, the Department of Finance. And the main changes are in the, um, the, it's the third page or the second page of the exhibit that is the prior period estimated obligations versus, ac versus actual payments. When we completed the original, the first ROPS, which was January 1, 2012 to June, we had to estimate what was coming out of tax proceeds and what was coming out of reserve payments. Um, we were a little bit off in those numbers, so when we came through with the estimated to actual and what they, they're calling the RPTIF, um, that was about 67,000 less than the gross tax proceeds that we received. So from that, we have learned that uh, the auditor controller was supposed to request those additional funds to be sent back to the county and the state. And so this um, ROPS that's in front of you um, reflects those changes. I also included the um, cash flow forecast that our consultant had prepared. And because of those changes, the um, loan balance had to be increased by that $67,000 amount. Okay. Does council members have any comments or questions? Well, these changes are, are something that we anticipated at the last at the last meeting, right? Isn't this part of what we discussed? No, this is even um, different than that. It's, um, uh, and I don't think anticipated is the correct word. I think it was kind of uh, thrust upon us. Um, the auditor controller, myself and Gene, were working on this and the Department of Finance giving us direction. It was kind of changes that came up. I had even looked, um, which is typical for me for something creative and aggressive to look at this and thought, well, we should have revised that first ROPS, which I'm using Roman numerals just to signify the first, second, and third. But to do something like that might um, bring more trouble than it's worth just to correct it. Um, we're going to return those monies back. So the loan payment that was made in January for the final redevelopment um, loan payment to the water fund, um, we had to reverse 67,000 of that loan payment. So the loan balance went from uh, 1.2207 to 1.67. It went up by the sixty-seven thousand dollar amount. Okay. okay Any other thank council you. comments? So does this then have to go to the successor agency oversight or the board. oversight board? Yeah, and that's why we put it in front of the council tonight. Um, we've got a special meeting set up with them because at the last oversight board meeting we had a little bit more additional information and knew that we were going to have to bring it back in front of them. So this way, at least the successor agency will see it, and we're we're sticking to the same order and meeting the um, September 1st deadline that the Department of Finance came out with this new form that just, uh, I think it was only posted um, three weeks ago. It was the legislation that was approved at the end of June. So this is all completely new forms, trying to figure out how these are supposed to be interpreted and, and go forward from there. So we will be in the proper pr um, order where the successor agency, you, you um, will see it first. Next Wednesday, I believe, is our oversight board meeting. They will see it. After they see it, then we will submit it to the Department of Finance and be able to meet the de deadline of September 1st. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the council? All right, I'd entertain a motion to approve resolution 212-30. As, as much as it pains me to do this, um, I will recommend that uh, I'll make a motion that the city a successor agency adopt resolution number 2012-30 approving and adopting the recognized obligation payment schedule for the period of January through June 2013. First went to Health and Safety Code Section 34177. What is that? L? L. Or I. Okay. Is there a second? Second. 
Second. Been, second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any public comment on this item? See none. It comes back to the council. Would you pull the vote, please? Yes, sir. Director Holly. Yes. Director Westfall. Uh, no, this doesn't make any sense to me. That was a no vote. No vote. Okay. Director Shalong. Yes. And Chairman Ania. Yes. Item number three on our board tonight is a net updated review of the SERAF and Water Fund Loan Repayment Plan under Assembly Bill 1484. Is that you can and, talk about that? Or and Ken? again, I was going to have Ken McDonald, okay, Mr. McDonald, Finance Director, address this one. This item kind of dovetails into that. It has the same cash flow forecast that we're in there proceeding. Um, it ref it relates to that, and um, I've updated the uh, memo uh, a little bit for to reflect those. Um, so if, if there is any questions about the cash flow tables, table one and two, um, the staff report and the tables were supposed to reflect those changes that we just voted on. Does any council member have any questions on uh, this item? No, just thank you for trying to make sense of this ever daily changing it's historical time in California. The most difficult thing I've ever seen done on the fly from any state, and I've worked in four different states. <laughs> Thank you for that report. Is there any public comment on this uh, updated review? Seeing none, we'll close that item. Uh, was there any other items that uh, the members want to bring up regarding redevelopment agency items? Seeing none, then we will adjourn this board. Actually, oh, Mr. Ne yes. when is when is the um, oversight committee going to meet again? We'll be uh, actually talking about this tomorrow night at the joint city council county meeting, and then the oversight board. They've asked for an update for, with the whole board, and then the oversight meeting is uh, next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank so, you. Okay. We'll adjourn from this from this meeting to our next regular scheduled meeting, September 17th at 6 p.m. For, for our redevelopment agency, successor agency. We'll now return to the city council meeting. And we're at that point where it's public, uh, public comment period. And any member of the audience is invited to address the city council on any matter that's in, within the jurisdiction of the city of Crescent City. Comments of public interest or on matters appearing on the agenda are accepted. However, note that the council is not able to undertake extended discussion or act on non-agendized items. Such items can be referred to staff for appropriate action and may include placement on a future agenda. Any comments that are not made at the microphone are out of order and will not be part of the public record. After receiving recognition, please state your name and if you're a city or county resident. And public comment is related to, is limited to three minutes. Is there any public comment? Mayor Pro Tem, I'd like to correct my state last statement to sure. Council Member Hawley, the Oversight Board, is Wednesday, but it's at 1 p.m. So it's Wednesday the 29th, 1 p.m. in this room. Thank you, Mr. Palazzo. Is there any public comment at this time? Seeing none, we will move to item number seven, and this is a public hearing. And this public hearing is to consider the proposed fee schedule for the fiscal year 2012 to 2013 and take action as necessary and appropriate. Mr. Palazzo. Again, I'd like to Mr. introduce McDonald. Mr. McDonald. Okay. Mr. to uh, discuss the, the fee schedule. The fee schedule that was brought before you last time has a couple of additional items added on there, um, namely on the staff report page two, uh, the backflow prevention device administrative fee. Um, that has been added on. Um, most of the other changes were presented last time. It has... Um, all those changes reflected in the table, tried to or organize them by departments. And then if it says zero in the current fee, that means there's nothing charged now and we're pro proposing something different. Okay. If there's any question, I can try and address most of them. And any if I can, I have staff here to help. Have me. any uh, technical questions of Mr. McDonald at this point? No? Okay, thank you, Mr. McDonald. We may call you back. Okay, at this time then, I'll open it for public comment on our proposed fee schedule for this year. Does anyone have any public comment? Seeing none, we will bring it back to the council then. 
Is there a motion for approval? I, I would just like, like to say uh, for the record that the Fred Endert Municipal Pool and the reductions that you've, you've uh, managed to, to, uh, to, to help with, I do appreciate it because it's about the same amount of money that we were talking about during the budget session and uh, when we were talking about pool closure and you've managed to find some alternative and I, and I do appreciate your efforts there. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just wanted to thank uh, the POP group for being involved in that discussion as well. Um, I think people that use the pool um, and are willing to, uh, you know, raise funds for it should have their opinion considered. And so I appreciate you uh, coming to the table with, with helping us come up with those alternatives. Um, I did have a question Good. on the backflow prevention device. I know that the city um, oftentimes hires out um, a local company to do backflow checks. And can you give me a, an example of a situation where we would charge the customer for that? Yeah, let me try and go through that. And if I um, get anything incorrect, I've got Eric here to help me out. But we did go through this. Currently, um, in the past, we used to do um, the backflow uh, inspections. And ma mainly if you have um, special applications or if you have a, a well, a private well, we can't have well water intermixing or, or commingling with our disinfected and, and pure um, uh, city water. So a backflow prevention device prevents the mixing of the two. Currently they have to, they get notified annually that they have to inspect their device. Um, I think two or three local plumbers can do that certified inspection. So we no longer do it, but we have to send out notifications and, and monitor and manage all that. And without charging a fee for doing the actual test work, we're not recovering the cost of our time and, and staff to do it. And so that's what this, this attempt was to do. Okay. Any other questions of the council members? Thank you, Mr. McCann. Okay. Uh, one other thing I wanted to add to, I forgot. Um, we boiled it down to a monthly charge so it could be put on their bill. Um, it, it amounts to about what we're setting up as the typical administrative fee of $30. That's the $250 a month. The $0.50 cents per month for each additional device was an attempt to reflect that not the same level of effort is required for two devices as opposed to one device at, at one property location. Okay, thanks. Okay, and before we uh, vote on this tonight, I too would also like to thank Promote Our Pool and Pop, uh, citizens that serve on that and helped us come up with the fees for the pool. Thank you very much. We don't get a lot of citizen participation sometimes and we appreciate it. Is there a uh, motion for this approval? Uh, real quick, um, sure. I just, there was one other thing, I'm sorry. Sure, that's uh, okay. On the drive-through <laughs> oh, uh, at the cultural center, I wanna be sure that we are not charging um, the health group, department. the health department that does the senior citizen uh, mm -hmm. flu shots. That was, uh, I think, the $30 admin fee to process their application. That was the whole intent of, of that, I thought that section. So you charged them the, the admin fee before it was on our fee schedule? I don't remember if what we charged last. I think we did charge an admin fee this last year, yes. They didn't do it this year. It was last year. Well, I know that uh, Dr. Martinelli called me directly and said that uh, he was concerned that the city wanted to charge them for providing free flu shots uh, and at you know underneath the the overhang at the cultural center correct and I don't think we I mean my personal opinion is that we should not be charging for that so um, you know, what's proposed on the fee schedule is a $30 administration fee you know, for those types of instances, you know, so we can evaluate, you know, what they want to do and, and cover our costs of doing that. And could that, if we pass this, could that come up if they apply and ask for a waiver? We could discuss that at a meeting. Well, I mean, the whole intent of a, of, of a fee is to collect the fee and I keep coming back to the council and, you know, apply for waivers, you know, okay. but, you know, it's either we charge it or we don't, you know, I just, I would recommend the staff that we charge uh, for any time that we need to do some sort of service you know, to the community, you know, it it's covers some of our costs. Right. I just don't think that 
having an outdoor drive through um, when it's raining for senior citizens to not have to get out of their car for a free flu shot should be a charge that we that we have. And I would ask for a direction from the council. That's why I wanted to bring it up, to see how the rest of the council felt about it. Uh, Rich. Yes, go ahead. Mayor. Pro yeah. <laughs> go ahead. I just wanted to make a quick comment to the POP people. I completely forgot to do this in the past. And there is a number of people that would like to use the pool but cannot because we're allergic to the HFSA fluoride that's put into the pool water. So I wanted to make you aware of that. Thank you. Okay. Do you have a comment, Mr. Hall? I, I just have some mixed feelings. I understand, Kelly, I understand some of your concerns, but the health department does have a budget and $30, if, if it's consistently done for all groups, it, it seems to be a reasonable fee to me. Okay. okay. Any other comments? All right. I, I would accept a motion to approve the uh, fee schedule. I move to approve the fee schedule for 2000. It's 2012-30. 2012. Yeah, resolution number 2012-30. Any second? I'll second the motion. Would you please pull the vote? Yes, sir. Council Member Westfall. Yes. Council Member Shalong. Yes. Council Member Holly. Yes. And Mayor Pro Temania. Yes. We'll move on to item number seven B. And this is a public hearing reg regarding the final accomplishments made and to close our grant number 09EDEF6360 of our uh, CDBG grant. And I believe we have. We have Mayor Pro Tem Charlene. Uh, oh, Charlene is here. here she to is. do a presentation. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening and thank you. Um, this first item for the CDBG program has to do with um, an economic development grant that we received from the 2009 allocation. Um, this was the 09 EDEF 6360 and it funded um, North Coast Small Business Development Center Microenterprise Assistance Program um, in Del Norte County. Um, we did finish um, that grant out as far as fully expending the funds and completing all activities associated with it um, as of December 31st of 2011. Um, we're bringing it back now to close it out um, simply because there were other things going on um, in the first quarter of 2011, uh, primarily application for new CDBG funding and um, uh, an appeal process for being held out from that um, that we went ahead and dealt with instead. And we generally do an annual grantee performance report for all of our other grants at this time. So it was appropriate to bring this now um, to actually close the grant out. Um, during the contract period, during the reporting period um, that they reported this time was, would have been July 1st through December 31st of 2011. Um, they reported serving 44 small business owners or entrepreneurs during that period, 27 full-time jobs and one part-time job um, was reported as being created, and 31 full-time jobs were reported as being retained by those assisted business owners. And I believe we have um, some representatives from North Coast. Can you give me that summary again? I can. Um, it is also in the um, memo that we put in the agenda packet, but it is 44 small business owners or entrepreneurs, um, 27 full-time jobs and one part-time job created, 31 full-time jobs retained. Any other questions? Thank you, good evening. I'm Michael Kraft, I'm the director of the Small Business Development Center that serves Del Norte and Humboldt County and I live south of Eureka. I'm gonna add a little bit, the CDBG funds are crucial to us but they don't cover all of our uh, clients and so I wanted to round things out a little bit, give you a sense of uh, what 2011 was like for us 
and I, I did uh, present a handout with uh, some of the things that we and our clients did. So altogether in 2011, we served 236 clients. We had 49 different workshops, so those would include, you might have heard of our flight workshops, the business basics workshops that we do. Um, 11 business starts during that time. That's okay, I would say a little bit low, and we're never sure we get them all. Uh, 67 jobs created, 108 jobs retained, which is normally those track more closely together. It's, it was uh, somewhat high for being a tsunami year, so there was a number of businesses at risk due to that event. About $1.7 million in sales increase, that's quite good. About a dozen loans, mostly from family and friends. And those were just under $192,000. And about $964,000 in equity investments, typically from the owner themselves, the families. And that's consistent. Most businesses start with a few thousand dollars, most of it from savings and from family. It is, uh, I want to take the opportunity to say that we do provide free business counseling and free workshops to anyone. So the CDBG report that you're closing out tonight, that has to do with people with low and moderate incomes. But for others, we use our SBDC funding, uh, which comes separately uh, to fund those clients. And we have had very good support from both you on the council, from a succession of city managers and great uh, initial response with Mr. Palazzo. And I want to particularly say that Charlene Maisie is has been just a gem. We, we don't compete with, for these funds with other rural parts of the state successfully without somebody doing that job very well. The, you might be interested in whether the, how are we doing now? Am I on the three minute? No, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, you might be interested in how we're doing now. As you know, we've had some organizational changes, and I made the prediction to Charlene at the time that my guess would be that we would probably spend fewer hours with the clients, but have higher economic impact, or at least the same, and that is bearing true. We've got about, for the first six months of 2012 versus the first six months of 2011, about 540 hours versus 745 with Delnor clients all told. But we're ahead in things like uh, the number of trainings with jobs created, uh, with the number of loans, with the dollar amounts of those loans, those sorts of things. So we're, we're trying to do a, a very effective job. We've got a good set of contractors. We've got a great um, office manager, plate spinner kind of person in Jana Clemens. So we feel pretty good about where th those things are at. And uh, I'm sorry that the mayor isn't here because she was at our graduation ceremony for a couple of our flights. Yeah, she's ill tonight. And, and she's been uh, just lovely to us. But Mr. Palazzo was there as well, and if he wanted to share a little bit about that, I would gladly cede some of my apparently <laughs> unlimited time. I like having unlimited time. Did you want to say anything, Mr. Palazzo? Yeah, it was uh, very inspirational you know, to attend, you know, the graduation and to see the businesses. You know, this was the uh, agricultural flight. Is that there were the, two? There was uh, that one and help me out, Janet. Urban farming. Complementary health is the other. So local farming and, and complementary health. Yeah, and, and yeah, I attended the local farming and the creativity. You know, the business plans, they all gave a PowerPoint presentation, got up and, and walked through their business plans. And I'll tell you, it was you know, very inspirational and you know, very rewarding to see you know, you know, the funds going to this type of use and, and helping these businesses get started. So, very good. And, you know, we don't work, by definition, we're the small business development center. And actually, small business, by the Fed's definition, is pretty large. But our clients tend to be fewer than 10 employees, uh, here fewer than five employees, but they provide a lot of the life and the essential services and that kind of thing. So, for example, Vita Kachina was one of our clients. They first came to us with an original idea in 2008 and got that going, and then they, they bought the kitchen store, as you may remember, and then they decided they wanted to add a food piece to their business, and that they came back and did more business planning with us, 
added that part. I think it's going pretty well. I understand they catered one of your events recently and, mm -hmm. and executed very nicely. Yes. And th those, are, those are the kind of people that we stand for. Those are the kind of people that provide a, t a ton of employment. And so we're happy to do it. I'm happy to take questions and really appreciate your support. Any council members have any questions? Mrs. Westwell? Uh, yes, of the 11 businesses that were started in 2011, how many are still in business? You know, we can report back to you on that. I don't have that with me now. Um, and, but I, in an earlier meeting today with Mr. Palazzo, he asked a similar question. And so I've committed to go get back with, with that. So I expect he'd bring that back. And I like the uh, fact that you said you've spent fewer hours but had better results. And I would like to see that you, you gave the number of hours between 2011 and 2012. But I'd like to see the increase um, in the results um, that you mentioned. Uh, would you like me to rattle off some numbers or would sure. you like a more formal no, reporting? No, sure, that'd be great. All right. So this is now a comparable first six months of 2011 to first six months of 2012. So a number of businesses bought or, or created was seven in 2011 and 10 in 2012, uh, January through June. Jobs created for two, the first six months of 2011 was eight and 14 for 2012. A number of loans and equity received uh, those kind of infusions so far in 2011 was six, 2012 was 10. And uh, those, the amount, uh, a little under 35,000 to over 52,000, uh, those are the, uh, those are the impact milestones that we track. And we, some of those will collect more in the end of the year, and, and you, we should report those back to you too, because some things like how many jobs were retained are, are more accurate at the end of the year. Increases in sales, people tend to tally that up year to year, not this time of year. So, so how does that um, match up to Charlene's report that there were 27 full-time jobs created? So Charlene's report was for CDBG funded clients for the, was it for the term of the grant. The three for years? The six months of. Okay, so the, what she had found was the last six months of 2011, what I was giving you was the first six months of 2011 versus the first six months of 2012. And as I just said, we tend to catch more of those milestones in the okay. back end of the year. We work with clients and pick up what they tell us at the time, but we get back in touch with everyone at the end of the year and say, you know, what happened with your sales? What happened with your profits? What happened with your employment numbers? So I, I would expect what I just told you for 2012 to be quite a bit higher in the second half of the year. Okay, thank you. Any other, yes. Uh, one more question. What are the parameters that describe small business? There's a number of definitions, but the one that gets triggered most often, you're going to laugh, it's uh, fewer than 500 employees. <laughs> okay. But what it means is, you know, in both of our counties, you know, if you have a chain store like Target or Walmart, they don't qualify. You have chain restaurants like Pizza Hut, they don't qualify. Any business located in any, either of the two counties that we, you know, headquartered in either of the two counties that we serve is a small business. Any questions? Any more? Thank you very much for um, enlightening us about the program. It's nice to see programs that work. It's nice to see grants that work. Thank and you. And thank that. you for making the trip up here. Happy to do it. Happy to do it. Thank, thank you. you. Is there any? We miss Barbara. Yeah. For the record. Yeah, we miss Barbara. <laughs> Is there any public comment? Any further public comment on this grant for small business? If not, we'll turn it back to the council. Yeah, this was just a staff report, right? No, oh, okay, and we had the public. Oh, it's a public hearing. So I already asked if there's any comments, and no one has any. So, it doesn't have to be approved then, right? Yeah. There's no approval. No, this is still part of the report. Oh. You haven't taken I, I believe oh, yes. you do have to accept the report and okay. then give staff direction to, to complete the closed out process. There's no other public comment on the small business. Okay, then I'll bring it back up here and close public comment. It's council's pleasure. I'll, I'll move to accept the uh, report. I appreciate it. It was an excellent report. 
and I move, uh, or I, I would ask that uh, staff complete the uh, closeout process. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Done. Passes four to zero. We'll move on with item number 7C, and this is another public hearing regarding the accomplishments made through grants under the city and the state's community development block grant. And this is number 10 EDEF 7253 and 10 STBG 6708 and program income funding. Charlene. So this item is uh, a little more complicated and it represents activities that are still ongoing with open grants that we are not closing out. Um, the first uh, the first one that I have here is the 10 EDEF 7253. That is uh, the 2010 Economic Development Grant, and that again funds the uh, North Coast Small Business Development Center's Micro Enterprise Assistance Program that we just heard about. This one started in January of 2012, and so the numbers that are reported um, go from January of 2012 to June 30th of 2012. Um, at that point, the um, North Coast SBDC reported serving 74 small business owners. And just to clarify, for CDBG purposes, microenterprise um, businesses have to be five or fewer employees, including the owner. So that is a, a small subset of the whole um, client population that they serve there. Um, and uh, at that point, 10 full-time jobs were reported as being created by the assisted business owners. Um, the other grant that was open during this time was our 10 STBG 6708, and that is our community development grant. Uh, the programs funded through that grant um, were Rural Human Services Harrington House Domestic Violence Shelter, the Court Appointed Special Advocate Services to Children in the Juvenile Dependency System, Rural Human Services Food Bank, and the Fred Endert Municipal Swimming Pool. Uh, during the grant period, again, this, now this one was June, or July 1st of 2011 through June 30th of 2012. Um, for the Fred Endert Municipal Swimming Pool, these services represented approximately 1,679 individuals. And the way that that was um, calculated was taking the pool's budget um, dividing it by an estimated number of users and then applying that per user cost to the amount of grant funding that was available. So it was sort of back engineered because it's very difficult to track uh, service numbers for um, something like the pool. Um, the same period, um, RHS reported serving, um, and in the memo it says 900 victims of domestic violence, and that has been clarified that it was actually about 264, that that 900 was a duplicated count. Um, and then 1,694 households were served with food bank services, and CASA reported serving 31 children with court advocacy services. Uh, the third component of the report is the CDBG program income, and that is the local program income that the city earned through, um, primarily through housing uh, loan repayments. And if you'll remember, a couple of years ago, we did a public process by which we um, had several projects that we agreed to fund, and those are now starting to, to come to a close. Most of the ones reported here have fully expended their funds, and um, we're going to be kind of closing down those activities. Um, the activities that are being reported this time are the Del Norte Senior Center Nutrition Program. They received 15000 The Rural Human Services Supported Parenting Program received 10000 um, youth Involvement in Public Art, the Third Street Mural Project, received 10000 Uncharted Shores Academy After School Program Scholarships. Um, I do not have the exact number, uh, dollar amount that they received. That sounds right. I, it's an odd number, but I don't have it on the top of my head, but it was around 8000 um, The Children's Health Initiative Health Insurance Premiums, um, that was also... Uh, a similarly odd number. 
Um, and then Can Food Bank received 15,000 as well. Um, we've received reports from uh, most of these. I'm still uh, getting additional information from a couple of them, including Can. Um, the youth involvement in public art has not completed its project yet, so there will be additional information coming from them. Um, but what I have up to now is that um, the Del Norte Senior Center Nutrition Program uh, served 575 unduplicated uh, individuals with daily nutrition services, and that was um, with all funding, not just with the CDBG funding. Um, Rural Human Services um, was able to help 10 developmentally disabled families and with 18 children. Uh, the Youth Involvement in Public Art, uh, the Third Street Mural product, Project, so far has served seven youth artists. Um, Uncharted Shores Academy uh, was able to provide scholarships for 27 children to their after-school program. Uh, the Children's Health Initiative Insurance Premiums, um, 21 children received health insurance coverage, and that coverage was for approximately um, one year, a little bit less than a year. And then Can Food Bank um, reported to serving about 450 individuals with food bank services. So that is what we have done with CDBG money this year. Charlene, remind me, on the Uncharted Shores, I thought that the 8,000-ish uh, number that we chose was for um, new computers for the school. They had put some of that into their request that it was going to be sort of for things to to help the after-school program, but during the waiver process with the state, um, it became quite clear that there was no way to really document low-income benefit to buying computer equipment that was open to anybody to come in to use. I gotcha. So the decision was made that we would stick to scholarships for low-income children and that that was easy to track and easy to document. And I like that better yeah, anyway. It was much, it was complicated enough as it was mm -hmm. that, yeah. Councilman Roosevelt. Uh, what kind of audits are in place to verify this information that's submitted? Um, for the most part, these uh, individuals have been, uh, the individual organizations have been giving me their um, income self-certification forms for the um, individuals that are being served to show that they are eligible and they are providing um, financial documentation for how they spent the, the funding. In a couple of cases, we're paying the bills directly so we know exactly what, they're, what they're being, the money's being spent on. Charlene, on the two that haven't um, reported back to you yet, how long do they have to do that? Um, the uh, mural project is not finished. Right, and they're working on it. I they see. are still working on it. I, it looks just from driving by like we're fairly close. Yeah, they were um, working on it last week. I yeah, saw. so I think that one's going to be fairly close. The Red Cross was the other one that, for whatever reason, they're not on this list because they had no activity during the time. Okay. They've asked for a contract extension um, at no later than the end of this calendar year. I thought you said CAN was on there, but no. They well, CAN hasn't provided me with all of the documentation yet. And so, how long do they have to do that? Um, I am expecting it within the next couple of weeks. Okay. Wasn't the Red Cross to provide training to Hispanic families after the tsunami? Well, yeah, that was when they came forward with the idea, and I haven't asked the question of why they weren't able to put that together within the time that we've given them so far, but they did ask for an extension. And um, I don't, I, if, if you feel there's not I'd a take reason a close, to- I'd take a close look at it. Okay. I mean, we can say no if that's what you would prefer. Well, I don't remember exactly, but it seems that I recall that was the case. It was, the, I believe it was the impetus for the idea. So I'm not sure why the, the delay, but I can find out more information. Yeah, I'd okay. like to hear back. Okay. Thank you. Because I was really excited about this, the program income funds that we were able to use this time. Um, I don't remember us ever having the liberty that we had to 
kind of think outside the box with local organizations and fund some things that we normally couldn't fund. Mm -hmm. And I was really pleased that we were able to help a lot of kids through that process. It, it was a, a definitely a learning experience. I'm not sure I would recommend doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was a, the first time that they allowed us to do anything like this with the program income. So it was kind of a, an exciting kind of be able to do something remember different. Remember that? It was exciting. Yeah, I'll try to remember kids. that. Maybe, maybe in a month or so when it's, <laughs> when it's not fresh it. in my mind, I'll be able to go back and remember the exciting part. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. This is a public hearing, and uh, if anyone in the audience would like to comment on these, uh, this community development block grant, that you, block grant that you just heard about, we will take any public comment. Yes. Hi, I'm Don Yahtzee, County um, Rural Human Services Fiscal Director. And I'd like to comment on a couple of programs we have at Rural Human Services. Um, first of all, the parenting education program that was funded. I'd like to just say that the goal of the program was to improve the lives of the consumers. And we have a supported living program that has 40 some consumers. And those were the target group um, for this parenting education program. There are parenting education programs around, but they all use, uh, they all use PhDs and, and doctors and uh, are not limited in their funding. And we were convinced that we could uh, do some good with uh, $10,000. Um, and I think we did for 18 people. So it's been a real learning experience. We're, gonna, we're going to continue to work with these uh, people in the future. There are consumers and uh, we're gonna work with them through our other program, uh, supported living program and continue the parenting education. So I thank you very much for that. Uh, money really helped. Thank you. I, in training. I just have a quick question if I could. The parenting education that you have, it's for developmentally disabled adults? Is yes. that what it's doing? So it's developmentally disabled adult <coughs> parents parenting their yes. children? Is that, oh, okay. Redwood Coast Regional Center refers consumers to Rural Human Services Supported Living Program. They vet the consumers. They have to have right. mental learning disabilities before the age of 18. And they actually fund our Supported Living Program. And these are the same people so that are in the parenting program. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. Any other council comments? Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have another comment? Food bank. Oh, food bank. Yes. Thanks. Rural Human Services Food Bank. I'd just like to give a couple of statistics. It's a 28-month funding period um, from March 2011 through next June. Um, that's 57% of the grant is over as of the end of June. We have spent 53% of the funds, so we're on target. Uh, volunteer hours, 2,186. Cash contributions, about $8,500. Most of those come in, in the holidays. Dollars of donated food, almost $30,000. Um, vast majority of that comes in through the post office, Sutter, Sutter Coast Hospital, the Scouts, and then RHS Winter Food Drive. And we uh, distributed over 200,000 pounds of food worth approximately $223,000. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That's awesome. Thank you. Any other comments for the council? Oh, Jody, come on up. Sorry, I forgot we were under comments. I'm uh, Jody Hoon. I'm speaking on behalf of Harrington House domestic violence uh, shelter program. And I wanna take this opportunity to really thank the city for CDBG funding. Uh, a lot of the funding we get is very restricted. So with CDBG uh, funding, we're able to pay for the things that are really necessary that we need to pay for as, as um, such as a mortgage and uh, extremely important prevention work that we provide. Uh, CDBG allows Harrington House to be able to pay, like I said, our mortgage, and helps provide teen dating violence prevention in our schools. It also helps provide legal advocacy to victims of domestic violence. 
Last year, we assisted 122 people in getting temporary restraining orders, and we provided over 150 domestic violence prevention education sessions in the classroom, and that was greatly due to CDBG funding. Um, overall, um, just statistics, uh, what we did last year, and these are duplicated numbers, <laughs> um, 2,708 shelter nights, 8,099 meals were provided, 5,471 individual and group counseling sessions, and we provided uh, 1,036 victims of domestic violence with services. Um, and that's like a 12% increase since last year. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Judy. Any other public comment? Any questions? Yes, we have another comment here. I didn't realize I was taller than Jody. <laughs> um, good evening. As most, oh, I'm Christine Saletti from Casa of Del Norte. Okay. As most of you already know, uh, Casa of Del Norte serves our community's most vulnerable children. The vision of Casa of Del Norte is that all children will live in a safe and secure environment. Del Norte County continues to report the highest rates of poverty substantiated child abuse, teen pregnancy, and school dropouts per capita for the state of California. In fact, the California Blue Ribbon Commission on Child and Foster Care recommends court reform to include expanding CASA programs in order to make CASA volunteers available in every case. Typically, CASA volunteers serve one, um, on one case for a period of one to two years. This is why the CASA program um, must con continue to recruit, train, and support volunteers in our community. From March 2011 through April 2012, funds from the CDBG provided uh, trainings to seven new advocates. We supported uh, 55 total volunteers, 37 children directly served, 85 cases were monitored by the CASA program, 16 cases closed due to two children being adopted, Two children turned 18, so they aged out. 18 uh, children were, uh, went into guardianships, and four children were reunified with their family. In addition to time, the time costs that volunteers spend on their children, facilitating meetings and working with the professionals on their case, CASA volunteers produced 40 court reports and attended 169 hearings on behalf of their assigned case. CASA held 18 trainings during the period um, which our partnering agencies attended. Those uh, partnering agencies included probation, Department of Health and Human Services, Donor County School District, Child Abuse Prevention Council, Child Care Council, nurses, and attorneys. On top of the direct impact CASAs have on their child's life, um, their, their child's life that they serve, CASA volunteers contribute uh, a volunteer dollar of amount of over $91,000 during the time. This type of volunteer commitment and the support of our community gives our most vulnerable children the opportunity to grow, uh, to grow up to be productive, thriving adults. The CDBG funds were instrumental in enabling CASA of Del Norte to bring this support to the most needy of our uh, community, our children. Any questions? Thank you. I like that you say that the volunteers' time was worth $91,000, yes. but I can say, f based on experience, that their volunteer time is priceless to a child. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have a comment? Oh. Yeah, I just have a quick comment. Does CASA have any um, opinions as to why we have the highest teen pregnancy rate? Opinions? Hmm. You know, um, in down our county, I mean, we face high poverty rates. Uh, lots of school dropped out there's many reasons and i think that having a casa program is instrumental in helping to prevent teen pregnancies if we have um, adults who are working with the youth you know someone there to help guide them and be good role models um, but i don't know you know exactly what the reason is okay Jeff, come. no just just that i know that kelly and i both have supported casa for a long time having been past board members and i appreciate the work you do Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any other public comment on the CDBG grant? Come on up. Hello, uh, Stuart Nichols uh, County. Uh, just here to represent CAN and uh, give the council thanks for the opportunity to uh, uh, serve our community in the ways of uh, CDBG money and 
just uh, real quickly just give you some stats of what we've been doing uh, I think most people are aware of some of the, the um, um, leadership change in, in the beginning of the year and and uh, um, and also uh, not having that application in for the the, the next CPG so um, so I just wanted to comment on, on uh, uh, our uh, services here the community the last uh, six months um, uh, here in uh, 2010 just give you a total kind of idea of where we're at and where we're at kind of on track of what we've been doing in the past 2011 we did a, a total uh, annual this is a food box distribution of 5,456 boxes uh, today to count through uh, June uh, 2012 uh, 2,775 so uh, very similar numbers and uh, approximately about uh, 400 a month about 100 a week and um, and then uh, also people uh, directly uh, direct benefits with uh, people served uh, in uh, July 1st 2011 to uh, uh, June uh, 30th 2012 1634 was pretty comparable to the previous year July 1st 2010 to July June 30th 2011 of 1705 uh, so we're, we've been blessed to continue to serve the, the community in this capacity. Um, just kind of a, a bit of uh, information in 2012 in kind uh, food and other reports. Um, through uh, as far as uh, grocery stores and contributing the uh, perishable foods that can give a, a better, well balanced, uh, balanced uh, food box. It's uh, actually total retail uh, 300 and 2,815 wholesale uh, 181,689 um, goes into community food was uh, 10,814 and wholesale was 6488 uh, total food uh, retail value was 371,721 a wholesale was 223,032 dollars and um, the community at uh, wholesale clothing and in kind others was 4,092. The wholesale of uh, 2004, or excuse me, 2,455. And um, so, just to give you kind of some numbers there is that we're continuing to do the best we can to serve our community and, and um, especially these uh, resources that we've uh, uh, established with uh, the community uh, 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 grocery stores and stuff. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Stuart, who's heading up CAM these days? Uh, actually, the uh, new uh, executive director, his name is uh, Ray Palman, or excuse me, uh, Paul Raymond. And he's had uh, a lot of experience with food development, actually, in, in Africa uh, with uh, orphanage and, and uh, um, uh, for several years of work there. Any other questions? Any other questions? Thank you Thank very you. much. Anybody else want to speak on this? All right, so you know, I'll take it back up. Council members have any other comments? I'd just like to say thank you all for come on up. Uh, Jim Buckles with uh, a CAN board member. I just wanted to say thank you for the funds. Like they said before, it's flexible funding, but it's, it's valuable to us, and we wanted to thank you for it. Thank you very much. You. you know, it, 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 this time of year when we get these reports, we can really see that our CDBG money means a lot to our community. And our federal government is, is considering reducing these funds. If they came here to our county, they would see that they're really used, and they're used properly. And so it's, it's nice to hear that. It's really helping people that need the help. With that, I'd entertain a motion to accept to complete the closeout of this process. Charting? Uh, Wait a second, maybe I... Um, for, for this item, we just need you to accept the annual reports. We're okay. not doing a closeout on this. And oh, okay. I would just like to comment on what you said about the federal sure. um, budget. Um, this is one program. There are other programs that help the low-income population that are being tar um, targeted during the, the budget 
process yeah. process in Washington and I think it would be a very helpful process for people who benefit from this to start writing to their representatives even though our representatives are sort of preaching to the choir yes. I think it's important that they have that to talk to their colleagues with to talk about how valuable these programs are to the community I agree thank you thank you very much uh, I would move to accept uh, the report uh, based on the public hearing we've had tonight for CBG grant number 10 EDEF 7253 and 10 STBG 6708 uh, program income funding. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes four to, to zero. Thank you. We're at number eight now, and this is under new business. And this is to discuss an amended and restated to the memorandum, memorandum of understanding between the city of Crescent City and the county of Del Norte and to take action as necessary and appropriate. Mr. Palazzo? Yeah. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, the last several years the city and the county have entered into an agreement in contract and share basically services uh, between the city and the county. Uh, last year we entered into an agreement. Uh, a lot of the focus was to have the county hire a hearing officer uh, and have the city share in, in half of, you know, of that process and, and that has been completed and done. Uh, we had some other uh, items in here of you know, sharing the building inspector, sharing some you know, climbing gear. O overall, everything has, has been working out very well. Uh, this item is on the agenda for the joint meeting uh, tomorrow night. Uh, but what I thought I'd do is, is bring this before the council to see if the council, you know, wanted to discuss a any of the items that are in this agreement. The one item that I did highlight in the staff report is the building inspector services. And I'd like to touch on that just, you know, briefly. Uh, the, you know, right now the current agreement is that we contract building and uh, uh, plan check services and building inspection services to the county. Uh, we collect the, the fee on that and distribute 80% of that fee to the county for those services. Uh, did uh, uh, an analysis on basically what those fees have been, uh, what we've been collecting over the last four years. And uh, you know, basically with the total revenue, the county is getting about 80% of that. There are some gaps in that uh, uh, service. Those gaps include the business license inspections. Typically what we like to do is when we have a new business license, our fire inspector, our building inspector goes out and does those inspections to make sure that those new businesses and those buildings are up to our, our, our current code. Uh, the red tagging, uh, they have been doing that uh, on a requested basis, but you know, that is something that you know, we feel in the city is probably not happening as often as it needs to be of, of being out there and you know, the eyes in the community to see if there are uh, things that are going on that, that shouldn't be. Um, and then just general requests, if a citizen you know, needs an inspection, you know, I, I believe they've been doing that, but it does take you know, a little bit of time. It's the customer service aspect of it. Uh, we've talked to the county on this and the county did provide us a letter uh, saying hey they would provide those services it, it would be $47.50 uh, inspection fee in order to provide you know any of those services uh, so wanted to have a discussion you know with the council on that if we can continue with our current process uh, an alternative would be to you know try and yeah, figure out a, a way to recover some of those fees uh, so the county can you know, continue, you know, basically not out of, out of the city's pocket to get those services done. Uh, and then also included an option of hiring you know, a half-time uh, building inspector, you know, kind of time basis, you know, we either work 20 hours a week or 10 hours a week as we need them uh, to you know, cover those uh, services you know, for the city. Uh, one of the things that I did analyze that I don't have in the staff report uh, was a thought uh, after you know, preparing this document was how many new business licenses do we typically get? So I asked the finance department to give me, you know, in the last year, how many new business licenses and how many transfers of businesses ha have we received? In the last year, we've had 47 new business licenses in the city. So 
that amount, you know, inspection wise at $47.50 would be about $22. Hundred dollars uh, to do those inspections or, or, or fees that would be collected. A uh, number of transfers included 14. So 14 businesses in our community moved from one location to another, which would, in you know our code, we would want to go out and inspect and make sure that they meet those standards. How are we handling it currently? And I say that because it seems that some things may have been falling through the cracks on uh, inspections um, being handled in a timely manner. Uh, um, I don't, you know, typically in an inspection. Well, I, I don't mind pointing it out. Um, so uh, the new hotel, I understand okay. that there were some issues in um, not just the city's um, end, um, but on their end as well but I also heard the comment that the inspector wasn't going out and checking to find out if they were taking care of the issues on a time in a timely fashion so whose responsibility is it to make sure those projects go smoothly you know um, it, under this contract well, I'm kind of back up and I, I don't know if I can answer your question directly on the responsibility um, I can kind of answer what my expectations would be under this contract and, and there there may be things that we need to work with the county to to smooth out our processes if we continue uh, down the road of, of contracting you know with the county for this service it, typically when an inspection happens you know or once you issue a building permit there's certain points within that process where the owner needs to call and ask for an inspection and the county has a process I don't know the timing the of that or the contractor I'm owner the yeah contractor on path the owner calls asks for an inspection I don't know and maybe you know, Mr. Taylor or and Mr. Barnes can help me with the timing of how long you know what the expectation is you know for the county inspector to go out there and, and do that inspection it, it should be call in the morning you know inspect you know, within you know that that day maybe it's a 24 hour period on, on, a, on the inspector going out um, you know if there are issues or concerns with a, a, a building you know my expectation would be contractors driving by stop it or excuse me the building inspectors driving by stop in see how things are going you know that's our customer service you know we, we need to you know the businesses and the success of the businesses and getting them established is the city's success so you know that customer service needs to be you know forefront for us to be you know successful right and, and that's the path I'm kind of and, and that's the path asking I, about and that's the path I want to go down I, I can't say that our processes and procedures are solid and in place for that path currently um, and that is something that you know we've talked about and evaluated and, and you know if we continue down this road with the county we need to have some, some clear understanding of, of what that path is and then also how do we you know cover you know, some of the gaps that we're not getting such as the um, you know inspections for when you apply for a business license how do we get you know cover those costs and get that inspection completed I think in general, and I've been watching at the county, the, uh, they get out the same day they're called on the inspections. And <clears throat> uh, Dave Thompson was there by himself for quite a while, and then they brought Jeff Mitchell in, and Jeff was learning. And so I think they were very busy during a lot of the construction of the hotel. So I don't know whether this particular time is a good example to see well how's the department doing in that regards and I don't think necessarily they have to go out and talk with people and say how are you doing on this they're supposed to be called for the inspections nonetheless it is a good service especially when you have builders that aren't your big builders like your Walmarts and the, and the big construction companies to uh, go in once in a while just to ensure that you don't have big problems at the end a lot of our permits and I went through back through and see the number of permits and, and a lot of our permits are the, the smaller 
you know, add-ons, remodels, things like that. And a lot of that is, you know, more importantly, the customer service is needed. You know, the larger, you know, the, the hotels, you know, those are very important too. And and we need to keep, you know, it, it's very important to get those types of businesses, any business, <laughs> open and uh, and operating, and to have that customer service. Um, you know, presence with our building inspector. So speaking of building inspection, um, have we addressed the downtown uh, building or remodeling that's been going on? Yes. That we were unaware of? I, I believe Taylor, that's been Who's the that? um, building ne near City Hall there that's been red tagged and they've stopped work for now. And that's actually kind of a good example we're talking about here too. So, uh, some of that work was done over the weekend before they actually had acquired the permit. Uh, so Monday morning we came in and city staff saw what was going on and so then we actually made a phone call to the county and asked them to come down and take a look. And at that time they came down and red tagged the building. But again, the customer service and it's, and that's one nice thing about having it in-house is you have better oversight on what's going on. And you have that person dedicated just to the city to doing work in the city. Uh, again, it, something like that it's good to have somebody just dedicated driving around the city and looking for violations and looking for a lot of these things that get missed because right now with the county they're willing to red tag but we have to call them and ask them to come do it yeah. I mean at that point I we could just do it through code enforcement or, or avenues that we have but sometimes it's beneficial to have that person have control over that person well I certainly am in favor of sharing services with the county but I think that if if this is kind of where we're you know weak that if we continue that we need to have a better outline of how we're going to do business you know when we first started this a few years ago we wanted to try it because our building inspector had left and our plan checker had left and that's why we put it in a 30-day clause and to my knowledge it was working okay but now with these other things coming up you know i don't i don't think that we ought to be paying this stuff and if you can't work anything out with the the county and we can find someone that's licensed that can do it part-time as an on-call, it might be worth our while to consider doing that. That's just my opinion. Councilman Rowling? Yes, I, 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 I kind of feel the same way. I'm looking at it. Right now, if there's a red tag situation that we just described, how, who gets paid? How, how does payment come for something like that? Well, that was kind of one of my gripes. <laughs> uh -huh. I was doing something through code enforcement, and so to cover my time, what I was doing was I, you know, was basically writing citations to cover my time. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, yes, yeah, so if we did that, well, you know, we'd be covering that, and then so we, we'd, we'd be covering a permit, it. and then they'd be getting eighty percent. But then we're putting in the extra effort to go out and find the red tags. And uh huh. That's what I was care thinking. Of that. So I was found. It, so my situation, I found myself just actually issuing citations to try and cover some of the code enforcement costs that were going into it. Well, I, I'm feeling like there's a lack of education on, or a lack of understanding on expectations um, between the city and the county. And, you know, if that can be corrected, obviously sharing services so people don't lose their jobs um, is the best way to handle it. But if it's not something that's going to work out, then obviously you know, having an in-house in person that, you know, that we're in control of and, and can set those expectations is good. But I, I am fully supportive of continuing to share services with the county to save money. Any other comments? Okay, this is, um, is there any public comment on this issue? This memorandum of understanding between the city and the county, and it'll be discussed tomorrow night tomorrow evening here when the city and county board of supervisors have our joint meeting six o'clock tomorrow or five it's at uh, five thirty five thirty oh, right in the middle there five thirty so this will be coming up again okay we'll move on to the next item and that's legislative matters and we're going to consider uh, legislative matters um mr palazzo did you have any oh you have one here Discuss Assembly Bill 2451 by uh, Assemblyman Perez to take action as necessary and appropriate. Did you want to discuss it? Yeah, th this was a request by uh, Mayor Murray. Uh, this came across um, in an email uh, to do a letter of support uh, for you know, this uh, bill. 
and try and summarize the legislation here. Uh, actually, I can you know, read it out to you, or you guys can go ahead and read it. I've read the it. Best way to do I've it. read it also. And so, any any comments? On the Councilman, any direction? comments on the bill? Did you want to summarize it for the public, Rich? Yeah, this bill would extend the statute of limitation for a presumptive death benefit claim filed on behalf of a firefighter or a police officer has had a detrimental fiscal conquest consequence for the employees. So right now there's a four and a half year statute of limitations uh, on work related death benefits for public safety officers who die of a disease uh, that's job related. And this would extend it to, I think it's 10 years, isn't it? How long is it? If I think if it what I'm eliminates. reading is correctly, it eliminates, eliminates any statute. So there is no statute in case they so contract, right. they contract uh, diseases like um, heart disease, cancer, tuberculosis, blood-borne pathogens, and things like that. And you know, on the face value of it, being a retired policeman, I thought it would be a good idea. But then again, how do you, the argument is, how do you know six years after you retire, how can the city defend itself if somebody develops a blood-borne pathogen? How do you know if there's no record and you've been retired for six or seven years or 10 years? And so I think that's the problem with the bill. Yeah. And uh, that's why many cities uh, are not in favor of this bill because there is no limitation. I think it creates a huge encumbrance for, for um, public entities um, uh, and a encumbrance that really can't be estimated if it's open-ended. So I, I would hope that the six years would be sufficient. So a four and a half or four and a half yeah yeah I, I am in support of opposing the bill any other comments about it Councilman uh, Westfall I agree I had a friend from junior high school that died of mesothelioma just a couple years ago and the wife wanted to sue and it was like where did he contract it yeah you know, so I agree so I think we're in agreement here to oppose it okay. at the uh, at the conference in a couple of weeks. Yeah, actually, this would be a let this would be a letter. Oh, letter. I'm sorry. Of opposition okay. that we I would think submit. we're unanimous. I don't think we have to vote. We're all in agreement to oppose sounds, it. So sounds good. I got you may consensus. you can send that letter. Looks like it has to go in tomorrow. It yeah. does. You know why? Because there's only 10 days left of the legislative yeah. session if they're going to try to approve that bill. Okay. Next is the city manager report and city council directives. Do you have anything to report, Mr. Plaza? I have nothing. Okay. Next is uh, reports, concern, referrals. We'll start with you, Mr. Holly. Thank you. Uh, I had the honor of going to the police explorer graduation, and that was uh, very, very interesting. It was, it was most impressive. Uh, 25 young people that went through a very intense week uh, with some excellent training. And uh, I, I th it looked like it was, uh, it was well received by everyone involved. And I, I hadn't had any exposure to that before. And uh, I appreciate that opportunity. Also the Front Street uh, design meeting that, that I think most or all of us attended. Um, it, that was an interesting process, an interesting public process. Uh, I think there's a lot of interest in, in, in what we're looking at as far as designing a Front Street. There's, there's certainly a lot of ownership uh, and community um, Ownership and, and the idea that, that a community-based process is what we should follow. And so Rick, I think you're talking about the beachfront master plan. Beachfront. Beach what did I say? Front Street. Front Street. Front street. Front street. Beachfront is you what I meant. Front. <laughs> but it's a long front street. Yeah. It's, it's, it goes. It's, it, anyway, thank you for that correction. <laughs> but anyway, it was a good process, and uh, I enjoyed going through it, and I look forward to the next one. In a few months. Councilmember Westfall, did you have some? I attended a Redwood Coast Transit meeting, an IGRC meeting, a school board meeting, and I especially liked the hot dog barbecue that the police put on at the fairgrounds because I got to meet a lot of the explorers there. And what was interesting is one gal came from a family that are police, and another kid came from a family that were crooks. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of very interesting talking to their backgrounds. Um, I also went to the farmer's market, supervisors 
meeting, a uh, disabled group meeting called People's First Group. Uh, I really enjoyed the master plan meeting for Beachfront F Park. I thought it was fun, and I thought Kelly Schlong's table gave an excellent presentation. Um, and the Salmon Festival in Klamath was terrific, too. Thank you. Council Member Small. Uh, I attended a lot of the same uh, events. Um, I specifically enjoyed the Beachfront Park Master Plan. Um, and the reason I enjoyed it so much is because we had about 50 people there um, participating in the process. And anytime you have that many different perspectives, uh, you can usually come up with a pretty good plan that'll please quite a few people, <laughs> not everybody. Um, and also uh, enjoy the uh, law enforcement night out at the fairgrounds and seeing, uh, got to go around and meet some of our regional law enforcement agencies and see the kids in action and so um, that was a good evening. Um, and uh, just wanted to remind everybody that there's a joint city county meeting tomorrow night. And uh, before we know it, Sea Cruise will be here. That's true, will be. Well, I attended those same meetings, the Beachfront Design, which was great. The Explorer Leadership Academy was fantastic. It's nice to see 25 people graduate from both here and Humboldt County. And also the Redwood Coach uh, Transit uh, that we did. And also on um, Saturday, I went to the uh, Assemblyman uh, Jared Huffman's uh, uh, barbecue that he had at Beachfront Park. He's probably going to be our next congressperson. And so I had a few minutes to talk to him about our issues here, which he is very familiar with now. And uh, they're quite different than Marin County, where he's from. But he promises as a congressman that uh, he's in very he's in close touch and friends with our congressman currently Mike Thompson so we'll have two congressmen we discussed uh, many things about he can see Crescent City and what what we need here and what the coast needs and it's nice to have our new congressman represent nothing but the coast of California and that was a, a redistricting that they did so he'll represent up and down our coast and many of our issues are the same and so that was a pleasant meeting and there were several people there and he promises to come up several times a year. So we'll see if that happens, but it's, it's nice to know that we have a, a future Congressman that cares about us. And anyone else have any last comments? Mayor Pertin. Just, just that I enjoyed uh, meeting Assemblyman Huffman, Huffman as well. Okay. Anything else? So we are going to adjourn, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm speaking out of turn. Go this ahead. is unusual. Go ahead. I just wanted to make sure that um, that we do say that the CCPD Explorers took the leadership award, and it was the first time oh, yes. in the history of Thank the you. That was, that was good. He took several awards at <laughs> that person. Our next council meeting is going to be about a month from now because we'll be attending a conference, the first meeting in September. So our next meeting is going to be on Monday evening, September 17th, right here at 5 o'clock with our closed session and our regular session is going to be at six o'clock. But we do have a special meeting tomorrow night, a joint meeting, as Kelly said, at 5.30 right here. And that'll be a joint meeting with the Board of Supervisors and the City Council. Did you have a comment, Mr. Plus? Any other comments? We don't have a meeting the first week? No, we're gonna be gone. We're gonna be in, um, we canceled it. We canceled that first meeting. It was gonna be on a Tuesday. That's and correct, we're that for San Diego. on the agenda. Oh, because of, because of Labor Day. Canceled it because of the holiday. Yes. So the next meeting will be on the 17th. And with that, thank you for attending. And we'll see you maybe tomorrow night. Meeting is adjourned.